Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, Evidence-Based Practice. This is Lecture C. The component, The Culture of Healthcare, addresses job expectations in healthcare settings. It discusses how care is organized within a practice setting, privacy laws, and professional and ethical issues encountered in the workplace. By the end of this unit, Evidence-Based Practice, students will be able to define the key tenets of evidence-based medicine, or EBM, and its role in the culture of healthcare. Construct answerable clinical questions and critically appraise evidence answering them. Explain how EBM can be applied to intervention studies, including the phrasing of answerable questions, finding evidence to answer them, and applying them to given clinical situations. Describe how EBM can be applied to key clinical questions of diagnosis, harm, and prognosis. Discuss the benefits and limitations to summarizing evidence. Describe how EBM is used in clinical settings through clinical practice guidelines and decision analysis. This lecture discusses interventions and how they are assessed in evidence-based medicine. Questions about interventions address treatment or therapy, as well as the other ways we intervene to improve health and eliminate disease. When evidence-based medicine is used to assess questions about interventions, the concern is about the benefit of a clinical intervention to treat or prevent disease. This assessment approach can be applied to any intervention, such as drug therapy, diet therapy, surgery, and complementary and alternative medicine. The best evidence for assessing an intervention comes from a randomized controlled trial, or RCT, or even better, from a meta-analysis of multiple RCTs. A key aspect of an RCT is that patients are similar in all regards with the exception of the intervention applied. This condition is the ideal. However, it's important to carefully assess this aspect when appraising a study because the ideal conditions are not always present. RCTs provide the best evidence for interventions because they allow us to reduce bias when participants don't know what treatment they are getting. For example, most of you probably know someone who touts the benefits of vitamin C in preventing the common cold. Maybe even you do. We all know people who say that since they started taking vitamin C, they never get colds. However, the reality is that there have been more than 30 RCTs that have assessed this intervention. When you eliminate the bias to people knowing whether they are taking either vitamin C or a placebo, there is no difference in the number of colds that people get. Another example is the Women's Health Initiative. Prior to this study by Chlebowski and colleagues, there was strong belief that postmenopausal estrogen replacement therapy was beneficial for women, that it reduced heart disease and cognitive deficits. However, this belief was overturned by this very well-designed RCT. Another benefit for RCTs is that they tend to focus on clinical endpoints and patient-oriented outcomes, or at least they should. In the 1980s, it was common to prescribe lidocaine whenever a patient had a myocardial infarction in the belief that suppressing cardiac rhythm abnormalities would prevent complications such as fatal ventricular fibrillation. However, the cardiac arrhythmia suppression trial, which randomized people to lidocaine and no lidocaine, showed that not only was there no benefit for lidocaine, but it was actually dangerous, bringing a quick end to that practice. There's a common view that any new intervention is better than the old. One researcher looked at radiation oncology trials and noticed that new treatments were just as likely as not to be successful. Just because something new is introduced doesn't mean we can't test it out. However, testing needs to be done in an RCT to demonstrate whether the new approach really is better. There have been other interesting findings about RCTs over the years. One is that there seems to be an inverse relationship between the quality of the study and the magnitude of the treatment effect. The better the design of the study, the lower the treatment effect, or the benefit, of the treatment. We'll see how this is actually measured in a moment. It has also been found that evidence of lower quality, particularly non-randomized controlled trials, is more likely to be later overturned than is good, high-quality evidence. However, it should be noted that well-designed observational studies in which you don't randomize and control people may be just as good as an RCT if the observational studies are well-designed and well-carried out. RCTs have a fascinating history. It is often said that the first RCT was performed by Dr. James Lind, 
who was a British naval doctor and surgeon in the 1700s. He performed experiments in which he gave citrus fruits, particularly lemons and oranges, to some sailors and didn't give citrus fruits to others. He noticed unequivocally that the sailors who were administered citrus fruits did not develop scurvy, which we now know is caused by vitamin C deficiency. Those who did not get the citrus fruits were much more likely to develop scurvy. The first true RCT was performed in the United Kingdom in the 1940s. The trial looked at the treatments for tuberculosis and compared streptomycin, an early antibiotic for tuberculosis, with a placebo. This study demonstrated clear superiority for the antibiotic. How do we critically appraise a study about an intervention? In the previous lecture, we discussed three questions that we ask of any study. Are the results of the study valid? What do the results show? Can the results be applied to patient care? Or in the case of a clinician, can the results be applied to my patient? To determine whether results are valid, we ask if the experimental and control groups began the study with a similar prognosis. Were the patient groups identical? Were the patients then randomized into the control or experimental treatment? Was the randomization concealed from the clinician? That is, did the clinician have absolutely no role in the randomization? If the clinician can bias the randomization, then the clinician will bias the trial. Were the patients analyzed in the groups to which they were randomized, sometimes called intent-to-treat analysis? Were the patients in the treatment and control groups similar with respect to the known prognosis? Sometimes the randomization does not work, and we end up with somewhat different groups, which raises concerns about the validity of the RCT. There are more questions to ask about the validity of the results. In particular, did the experimental control groups retain a similar prognosis after the study started? Were the participants aware of what group they were allocated to? Did the clinicians or the assessors, the people judging the output of the study, know which participants were assigned to which group? In some studies, the participants know what group they are in, and in a study of, for example, a particular surgery, the clinicians obviously know which participants are in which group. But we want to make sure that the randomization process works and that the assessors, to the best extent possible, are not aware of the group allocation. We also need to know that the follow-up was complete, that a large proportion of patients were not lost to follow-up. Once we are confident that the study is valid, we can look at the results. There are two major issues to consider. First, how large was the treatment effect, or how beneficial was it, if indeed it was beneficial? Next, how precise was the estimate of treatment effect? With the treatment effect, we ask about both the relative risk reduction and the absolute risk reduction. For the precision of the treatment effect, we basically need to know whether it is statistically significant so we need to know the confidence in our roles, or the p-values for the experiments. Once we know the treatment effect, we can ask whether the results can be applied to patient care. Were the study participants similar to my patient? If they weren't, then there may be some issues about the generalizability of the results. Were all the clinically important outcomes considered? Even though there is always a primary outcome in a study, did the researchers look at other outcomes as well, so that we can assess the larger perspective of the intervention benefit? And then, are the likely treatment benefits worth the potential harm and costs? We'll see that RCTs do not always do a good job of accounting for adverse effects, but we must analyze the reports of adverse effects so that we can balance the benefits and harms. Let's look at some examples of RCTs. A number of well-known RCTs come from the Women's Health Initiative, or WHI. Before the publication of the WHI RCTs, there were many previous non-randomized controlled studies that suggested women who at any time had used postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy, or HRT, which is an estrogen and or progesterone regimen after menopause, had lower mortality overall and lower mortality from heart disease. In general, RCTs and observational studies had yielded conflicting results. The original WHI study was the RCT that settled the issue, showing that HRT provided not only no benefit, but also possible harm from increased risk of breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. Further analysis of the previous observational studies found that they were confounded by non-similarities among users and non-users. 
For example, women of higher socioeconomic status, who were in general healthier, were more likely to use HRT. When these differences were controlled for, the benefit of HRT was no longer seen. An example of an RCT showing benefit for an intervention comes from a study of whether eradication of Helicobacter pylori bacteria from the stomach of individuals with gastric cancer, cancer in the stomach, reduces recurrence of the disease. This eradication was done with a combination of antibiotics and resulted in a relative risk reduction of 66%, or a two-thirds reduction in the number of cases of recurrence. This concludes Lecture C of Evidence-Based Practice. In summary, the most common type of question in EBM is about intervention, sometimes called treatment or therapy. The best evidence for intervention is the RCT, or a systematic review of multiple RCTs on a given topic.